All right, so we're here for another episode of The Throws Show, and I'm here with my co-host, Trevor Stutzman. Trevor, thanks for being here. <laughs> How's it going, Dane? <laughs> good. Like every week. Uh, um, Is that no. caffeinated? No, it's not. Oh, okay, good. I'm not, like, I'm not like Trevor, who will come in at 6.30 at night and take shots of stampede dry without any water or anything. <laughs> Sometimes you just need a little, a little extra to get going. <laughs> I just need a little pick-me-up, I think. I just need a little something to go. <laughs> Um, so we had questions on our AMA all day today on on Instagram on Throws University. And then in turn, um, an individual, Michael Hale, was posting a whole bunch of really, really good questions on Facebook on uh, on your glide video, actually, mm-hmm. um, which that was pretty good. I think you could slow those down a little bit, though. I even slowed down that one from the last one. The last one I knew was really fast. So okay. So I'll, I, I'll slow down. A bit in the more, future, yeah. 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 But um, he asked a whole bunch of good questions, and I, I tried to pick a couple questions from the AMA that I thought were pretty good, and a couple being uh, – we had a couple questions about it. Is being too flexible a problem with throwing, or should they always do yoga or mobility? And that's one of the later questions. So we'll, we'll, cover, we'll cover like um, – I say six, but it's probably going to end up being eight to ten questions, and then we'll get into the – then we'll close it up with the speed, the speed round. round of, of – Dane, uh, Dane's on uh, – I'm a little nervous for this, this time. Here. Yeah, I don't know. I'm a little nervous. I've got good questions. Jeff <sighs> helped me out a little bit too. That I know what probably like three of them yeah, are. probably. Because he's he told you everyone. <laughs> he's probably asking me the same ones. <laughs> you should ask Trevor this. Oh, that's a good question. He probably went over to Trevor. <laughs> yeah. This is a good question, right? <laughs> yep. So – the first question I have, and 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 this is from Michael that I liked was, what are my thoughts on velocity based training? And the reason why I like this is, I work with Nick Arrhenius, okay, and Nick uses a push the push app, which is a, it's something that's a, like a watch that goes on your wrist, and it, and it's not a watch, but it, it measures the speed of how of what how fast um, the load or how fast the load is moving. So it's similar to like a Tendo unit or gym aware is another tool that people are using, but Tendo units are a little bit more, um, a little bit more effective as far as measuring bar speed, um, and measuring speed of like dumbbells, if you're doing that or jerks or whatever. So it's, it all goes back to, so that, that's what you mean by velocity, velocity based, based training. training. Yeah. In a, in a, in a very short description, it is, it's using the feedback of these tools to monitor your progress. And I think so that uh, he w- he had asked what my opinion was. And, and my opinion, and I actually just had this big, long talk with, with Nick because I actually challenged Nick where I said, hey, I want you to go a whole four weeks where you don't use the push. You don't use it at all. Because he loves, like, and he's like, uh, you know, he's got his master's in, in um, exercise science, I think it is. So he's very... Uh, academic related and loves Mm. to chart everything which is very good Mm -hmm. but my thought process is that sometimes he gets a little hung Mm -hmm. up on it and i think i think it's effective but i think a lot of people they get so hung up on um the bar's not moving fast today so it's it's a failure whereas they don't see this big macro picture Mm. and that's where my thought process is is like I think that this stuff's good. I think Tendo units are effective. I think they're good at measuring uh, bar speed and and then giving you feedback on athletes. But I would use it more as like a gauge, maybe every two to three weeks, to see what the last two to three weeks of work has done, and then also use that as as you know long term. Okay, where were we at with this specific load six months ago? Yeah. Well, so I so the first thing that I thought when you said that is is it makes me think of like throws and how measuring throws has that variability day to day yeah and then of course the question would come up is do you think there's a correlation between say are you going to be on say you're on one day are you going to have a correlation between the speed that the bar is traveling and how far you're throwing so this is where nick just when he and i were discussing it because he he so i was challenging him saying I would want to know what your push says when you're doing like a hundred kilo snatch power snatch, like just as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. I would care more about that than I would care about what the push says at, or what the tendo unit says at 150. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I mean, I'd, I would still want to know, but yeah. but I wouldn't really care as much. And so he started to point out, he remembers watching an elite discus thrower at the OTC about uh, five or six years ago, and they had the tendo on him, and he was doing behind the neck jerks, and he, he got up to like 205 kilos, and they kept trying to hit this specific zone with the with the tendo, and they were going nuts. And Nick said he was sitting there thinking like, well, the speed was much faster when he was down at like 90 to 110 kilos. And especially, you know, Nick's master's thesis was based around the discus release and the flight of the discus and stuff like that. So he was saying, especially with something like the discus, it very well might be much more effective to value something that's closer. So like a 90 or 110 kilo behind the neck jerk to value that than it would be to value what your what your bar speed is at 190 kilos. Okay. Do you follow me? Yeah. So because it's it's closer to that to that speed and I and okay. my overriding thing is like I think I could use it for peaking my weightlifters. I do think I could use it to get like a sense of where what type of state my lifter or my throwers are in. Mm-hmm. But at the same time because we measure and at the same time I see them lifting so frequently that the guys that are on site, um, I can really see bar speed and I can talk to them about how they're feeling and stuff like that. And I, I think it's okay. I, I don't think it's amazing. I think a lot of people really like think it's the greatest thing ever. Um, I think it's also cost prohibitive. I think the thing is, is like, you know, so, so Nick actually even talked about, they bought push when push was uh, on Kickstarter so they got this screaming deal, and now they want to trade in to get the new upgraded one. This is like three years, and he's like, it's almost like we can't even afford it already. And for, for a gym like me, you know, I got to worry about today. This just happened today. The septic tank just got pumped. You know, my oil just got filled, and my propane just got filled. I got to spend money on stuff like that, yeah. and I can't spend money on push or tendo units or something like, like this stuff. So it's like it can be cost prohibitive for somebody who is – a private, a private entity, and I, and it's not really necessary for, you know, for for becoming for for developing, yeah, you know, the yeah, best possible yeah. throwers. It's a it's a measurement. It's a it's a de- determinant of where you're at, not a means to get somewhere. You know. So, yeah, I, I so think you're going to determine where you're at throwing by measuring your throws and and at competition. Um, so that's another measurement you can use, but it's not. So here's, you know, it's not a, it's not like gonna get you stronger, or get you faster. Right. It's just gonna, you know, tell where you're at. So here's a really good, a really quick example before we go to the next question is that, so Rachel, is on her fifth week of a program. So she's been training for almost twelve weeks, and I told her that this week she could max. So we like backed off just a little bit. Mm-hmm. So she feels weak. She hasn't hit any of the PR she wanted to hit, but like I told you. She's thrown 18 meters basically over and over again in training. Mm -hmm. Her spread between the 6K and the 8-pounder is almost always 13 feet. So what's that? Uh, Four meters about. um, Yeah, about four meters. So she's almost always about 13 feet on her spread, a four-meter spread. Today, she had way more throws out around 18 meters than she had before. But she only threw 42 or 4310 because we don't have a metric freaking tape measure, which drives me insane. <laughs> um, with the six kilo shot, which she has thrown 47. Mm-hmm. And so my response was, okay, when we backed off, her strength diminished, but her her Pop. force production yeah. was higher. Yeah. And that's what that's the yeah. feedback. Like yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah, telling yeah. Right, me what right. I need to see. And yeah. if, if we're exactly. tracking that, and I can see the the relationship between certain weights. That's that's more important to me than and because it's it's applied to the sport, you know. Right. So exactly. That's that's what that, that's sort of my take. I don't think it's bad, but I just think it's like I also just got a lot of other stuff that I got to worry about, and like worrying about <laughs> right. what my push thing is saying is just like I don't really care. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. But I, at the same time, with Nick, because he's not on site, it is good to get that feedback once in a while. Be like, hey, what, what's mm-hmm. your push saying? Because I want to know. Right. Um. So following that up. Trevor, what are your thoughts on, and I might have to, I don't know, do you know what the conjugate method is? It's like the West Side Barbell? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so. I don't know the ins and outs. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll pick on this, is that 
The next question was, what are the thoughts on the conjugate method in the in the off season for uh, throwers rather than the typical off season training? And I don't know what a typical off season training looks like. Um, so I actually would like you to go into off se- off season training that we use, mm-hmm. sort of versus like what everybody normally does, and then I'll go into why why I don't really like the conjugate method. But I do like it a little bit. So you want me to go for, say, what I feel like most people do and go say what we do? Yeah, say, say you know, like, what are we doing in the off season that's different from a normal a normal. Okay, coach? all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of different – a lot of people do a lot of different things and a lot of people do similar things to what we do, I think. But, um, but so mainly what we do is we have a really strong throwing – base so we try and throw as many times i mean we throw six days a week throw six days a week probably in shot put up to 30 throws a day discus 40 throws a day um so basically just getting you know that could be could be 200 150 to 200 shot put throws a week up to 300 disc throws a week trying to throw as much as we can and then in the weight room it's doing olympic lifts it's doing a little little higher volume we still kind of fluctuate between like higher volume and higher intensity, but, but trending towards higher volume in the, in the off season. Um, but we still do a lot of Olympic lifts, a lot of cleans, a lot of snatches, front back squat bench. Um, and basically trying to build a strength base while not completely veering away from the explosive side and the feeling of the throw. So the, the, basically the point is to, keep everything tied together with what we're actually trying to do, which is throw far while we're building strength at the same time. Right. That's probably the best way I could explain it. Yeah, I think that was really good. So that, that was my whole take on, I mean, that's how I see what we're doing in the off season. Whereas I typically would say most coaches would say like, Oh, throw one to three days a week. Mm -hmm. And then they do maybe a lot of bodybuilding stuff. But so he had asked, you know, what are my thoughts on the conjugate method regarding, um, regarding throwing in the off season i think to jump on it right away my experience and 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 for power lifters um and and this is to to just say the conjugate method is a method you know it, it was an undulating scheme that or an under an undulating periodization model that a louis simmons used and then he just sort of changed the name to conjugate method um, in the eighties and, and instead of calling it undulating, he, he's a good marketer. He, he changed it to conjugate method. And so it's basically, you lift a heavy, you know, like a heavy pull or a heavy squat at the beginning of the week on a Monday, you do a heavy press on a Tuesday, you take Wednesday off. And then on day three or day four, you do a speed bench or, or a speed pulls or speed squats. And then on the last day of the week, you do speed bench and, my take is is that I don't dislike that setup of like a heavy heavy uh, light light. I don't dislike that. I do like that that setup. But my problem is that in almost every I would say in every single experience that I've ever had with a thrower who just did deadlifts or or you know um, uh, powerlifter squats, they almost always struggled to move. Uh, as in in, with cohesive global movement, they've almost always struggled to be snappy. They've almost always struggled to, to not move through the circle like, like this and hit the front. Like uh, they're not like fluid and long and loose with, with their movements. And so I think the deadlift is a great lift for developing strength and for uh, being something that you can use. I think powerlifting is a cool sport, but I don't think that the deadlift carries over, well at all i actually think it doesn't carry over at all and i don't believe that uh, a power lifter squat carries over well to throwing either especially because the way that that these guys squat is they tend to their their knees never pass uh past their toes whereas human propulsion your knees are almost always passing your toes and that's where olympic weightlifting squats are a little bit different so my take is is that the, the conjugate method, the basic undulating principles are, I like them, but I don't like using the, 
I just don't like using the powerlifting movements to train to train strength in in Olympic era uh, in throwing. Mm -hmm. So I know that was a little long winded, but this sort of leads into the next question, which is a good question we got on the AMA on on throws you today was um, do we do do we do yoga or do we do specific mobility movements for our throwers and also on top of that is there a point when when it's you know when when being too flexible is a problem um so i wanted to touch on this and i think i think you do a better job with your throwers than i do trevor as far as the mobility stuff i try yeah. and like i try and really really piece it into the program and yeah. i'll have little mobility segments uh and i try and get them to do rom wads and i try and get them to do yoga uh but I don't hold them as uh, as accountable as I could. Whereas I'll come over to the other side of the gym and I see your guys doing not a ton of it, but enough that it's, it's going to be effective. I, th I think it just depends on like the person, honestly, yeah, because yeah. I feel like the, a lot of times if you're writing out a program and you have mobility in like a separate section, it's easy to just like skip over, skip over. Yeah, but if, yeah, yeah. if like how you do it, you work it in, it's just like, oh, well, this is just part of my normal lift. You don't really associate it as being in a mobility. Exercise. I think that's where Rachel is. It's like actually, Rachel, I, I make actually, her, yeah, I make her do stuff in mm -hmm. the session, in the lift, mm -hmm. and it's like you know she couldn't even catch a squat, uh, an overhead squat in the hole, and now she she can actually do these things in the hole just because that's how I I put it into her right, program. Yeah, and then and then I mean with that too, it, it also goes, it it plays and it works into the lift as well. So mm -hmm. I'm a lot of times you pair you know a specific mobility exercise with with a strength lift that yeah, does true. the same movement. And right. I think that works together well. But if you have someone who, who you know you're going to, you know, who's going to do everything you tell them to, no matter what, you know, then no you question, can. then I think, you know, doing, having another section as either as a warm up or doing, you know, rolling or um, stretches afterwards. Um, and I think, yeah, it, it does come just down to, you know, staying accountable and, and just making sure they're doing mm -hmm. it. Um, but um, I mean, I, definitely think, has this I think you and I have even discussed putting a book together about like, I mean, I think it's a good idea if we would do like yeah. a mobility specifically for throwing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I that, feel like everyone defaults to yoga just because it's something structured Yeah, and it's something that people know and are familiar with and comfortable with. And, I think and it's yoga, good. It is good. It is really good. But we could, you know, that's yoga. Yoga yeah. is yoga. Why not? have something specifically that can target, for throwing. Target, yeah, yeah, specific areas that are mm -hmm. problem areas consistently based off of the spin or based off the glide. Right, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's and, and to go on that, you know, we discussed this a little bit before we went live on the podcast, but when we were discussing this on Instagram live, is there a point of being too, flex, too flexible? And I had said how Dr. B got mad at Dylan and I um, and Je Jesse Roberts for doing Bikram yoga, which is hot yoga, and he was like, screaming like you better not do this more than than once or twice a month and he kept he's his english is terrible so he kept saying no you you go to throw and <laughs> and he would just say you go limp like so being too flexible can create this like flaccid movement that just has no tension mm -hmm. and so one of the questions we got is how can how can you actually create tension then if you are somebody who is hypermobile and i had said i actually think people who are hyper hypermobile shouldn't be spending their time doing a whole bunch of yoga or mobility unless they have a, a pain or, or, you know, something arises. I think that they should be, those types of people should be focusing on, on more like powerlifting type stuff or, or very high end hypertrophy stuff mm -hmm. that without stretching and, and staying in shorter ranges of motion, because that will, and that will lead to a little bit of a, a shortened muscle belly. So that's, that's, if you're hyper flexible, if you're not hyper flexible, which most people are not hyper flexible, yeah. you shouldn't be listening to what I just said. You should just pretend that you didn't hear that. But if you are a hyper flexible person, you have to shorten your muscle belly, belly, so that you aren't, you know, that guy who's able to take a, a javelin and like put it all over. Yeah, you know? right. right. Yeah. So, um, so the next question, what we got that I thought was great because it pairs with what we posted today on you on Facebook and that we posted yesterday on, on, on the garage strength, Trevor, you weren't associated with the John Powell analysis of technique. That was only <laughs> on garage strength. That was not on throws university. 
but I wanted to get out there. Uh, <laughs> so we had a comment, uh, why are people so rigid about technical models from the 70s and from the 80s? They're so rigid and, and defensive. Yeah. Um, and maybe not progressive. Uh, I think you'd be better to answer this because I'd just go off and... and take... Wait, what's the actual question here? So the question was, why are people so rigid about... Technical models, old technical models. I, I mean, I have a, I have kind of my whole philosophy about this. Honestly, I think I think people and and I'm gonna say this and completely honest, I you're the same way. I am the same way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but just to put it out there, but you're more progressive so that we than we recognize is. it. Yeah, yeah. At least if we recognize that this is a thing, I have I'm like probably a hundred percent a part of it. But um, that people do what they what they were taught. Yeah. So you have a high schooler who their coach taught them this way. They go through high school, they go through college. They're, you know, one college coach, one high school coach. Then they go on, they become a coach. They're going to do the same thing that their high school and college coach taught them. Yeah. Um, because I mean, for like, for one reason, there just isn't a whole lot of information out there right now on throwing. There isn't a whole lot of compiled information that, you know, there are a lot of videos you can, you know, see anyone's throw, um, but there isn't a whole lot of information where you can kind of pull from one place, take from another, and really craft how you feel the throw should be. Um, and I think what we do is just like a hand-me-down, kind of like a word of mouth, almost like a, you know, like a, a Greek myth, sort of like passed down from generation to generation type of throws coaching yeah and i think that's how this all plays into it is that this is what my coach taught me it's all i know so that's what i'm going to teach everyone right and um and i'm i'm guilty of that and i don't think you are though i think that that's where i actually was going to call you out on this in the beginning but i wanted to let you speak instead of being typical day and just <laughs> cutting you off is that i think you're full of crap when you say that you're you're part of it i think so if you think about what I taught you, you know, 10 years ago to now, that model has changed a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And on top of that, you have challenged me. I mean, you challenged me a year ago with technical stuff that I was having you say to Rachel. And even to this day, I will look at technical models or people that I, that I looked at as my technical model three years ago are no longer that technical model. There's a new model. And, and I think that that's where I think you're not giving yourself enough credit because I think you are super critical. And, I, and at the end of the day, what I see is that we have principles in place for models. Mm -hmm. And if we can see and we can pull from these athletes and, and then just see little tweaks that we would make on them, we can pull that this athlete's good, this athlete's good, and we can create a model. But at the end of the day, there's a principle behind behind that that technical model. And if it doesn't fit into those principles, then it doesn't then it doesn't fit the model, and you have to challenge it, and you have to make it, you have to progress right, from there. Right. But I think where with with you, I think you do that. I think you sit there and you're like, well, why are we doing this? And if if I have an explanation, you listen. And if mm -hmm. and it's the same way. Like I'll say, hey, what do you think about this? And you're like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe maybe it's because of this. And I think that. You know, I remember for the longest time it was it was Sam's left leg out of the back, and and yeah. so that's the thing. Yeah, so that's the thing. Like, I don't think that you do fall into that into that mode, and I, and I think that that's what it comes back to is that it's if you can constantly go back to why are we moving these specific ways, mm -hmm. and if I can have an explanation for every single reason, mm -hmm. and a logical, scientifically based reason, not just some big words that you make up that, and that's the thing that I think yeah. is that a lot of these guys that are very rigid about these, these things, their principles that they think that they know are getting challenged and they get so, mm -hmm. it's just like politics. It's, mm -hmm. they can't fact, they can't fathom that they might be wrong and that they might have been ill-informed or maybe they just didn't have the access to the, to the information at the time. But they struggle, and everybody's mm -hmm. like this, dude. I yeah. struggle with stuff like this too. Like, I mean, I'm not perfect. I'm, I maybe I am, but I. I uh, <laughs> but everybody does struggle with that, like right. yeah, with being yeah. challenged. And I think yeah. that's the biggest thing is that if if somebody sees something that my athletes are doing, um, you know, one of the guys had said, "Hey, I don't like the way Rachel starts in the back." And I was like, 
and I think I might have even talked to you about it. I was like, yeah, I gotta, I gotta change that. I don't, I don't like it. Mm, but you yeah. get so ingrained as a coach, you just see it every day, but you don't think it's a problem. Right. So I think it's important that we do challenge even our own models, and then try and make it make progress from there. Mm-hmm. You know, if we're yeah. constantly trying to base ourselves off of guys from the '70s and '80s, like that doesn't that. Like there, there's more alternatives, you know. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I, I think it's important to challenge yourself with that, and I, yeah. I think you do do a better job than you give yourself credit for, Trevor. Oh well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I agree. I think it just comes down to yeah, being critical of yourself and not not feeling like you have to, like you're just so ingrained and so a part of something that you have to defend it no matter what, and that you can find like okay, maybe in this situation that is right, and in this situation. It needs to change, right? You know, and just judging case by case, um, you know, what actually needs to be done to to make someone successful. You know? So that 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 guides us to this next. I, and I want to have at least one technical question that's actually based around technique before we get into the last question you had, and then anybody out there that has questions. Yeah. We got a question about if you're a right-handed thrower, how do you rotate your right foot? How do you turn the right foot in from the middle into the finish during that finish? How can you help that that right side continue to rotate? And I think this goes in line where, for the longest time, I did Is this not in the in the spin. Yeah, in the Blind? spin, okay. in the spin. Um, for the longest time, I had I probably went the first eight years of coaching from 2008 until 2016, where I did not cue anybody to turn their right foot. Ever. I never said it. I never. It was like one of your. Like, that was like, I was like. Like one of the three. We're not like, turning the right <laughs> foot. You're stupid if you think you have to. And then I sat there and I'm like, you know what? I think it has to happen, but I think that it needs to happen. That was exactly one of those things. Yes. Yeah. Where I was like, dude, I, I, I think that there's people that need to have that right yeah, to yeah. Uh, Right foot turn. <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> but. It happens by holding that flexion, holding your 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 heel elevated, holding plantar flexion. And at the time, I was like, "Oh, well, it's just a support system." And so what ha- what ended up happening is I I had this long talk with my brother, who's an aerospace engineer, and he 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 sees things very very well. And he was like, "Well, no, like if your right foot is the support system, your left leg out of the back is responsible for that right side turning." But the support system still has to have that heel up. And instead of it, me thinking it was like 10% support and 90% your left leg turning it, my brother was sort of like, well, dude, you still have to hold knee flexion and plantar flexion in your right side and a little bit of hip flexion. And that is much more than 10% of your, of your energy. That support system is probably like 40 to 50% of your support system. Mm. So if the left leg is active out of the back and if the left leg is rotational, and that's where I don't like that high left leg, I like that wider, lower left leg, especially, well, in the shot and in the discus, obviously. Um, when it, when that, that is responsible for the right side turning, but if you can think about that right side a little bit, turning and you might get to the point where you do have to cue it to turn to keep it down longer Mm. so i think that that's that's sort of my explanation for it i and i i don't you know i do if i see somebody that their right comes up early it's funny because sometimes i'll keep i'll cue them to turn their right foot but sometimes when people cue their right foot they extend their right so you have to tell them to keep your right knee flexed Mm -hmm. you keep that right knee bent and the right turns. It's mm-hmm. not an extension of the right knee. It's more your, or yeah, it's more you're turning your right foot from your hip and from your knee. Yeah, right. Yeah, that that's what I was gonna say. Is that like even though the the foot's just a small little piece, but right. if you think the whole right side is actually what's, in addition to the left side, is what's you know creating that rotation. So the knee and the hip are much more powerful than like the ankle. Like obviously the ankle can't really rotate too much, but if you think getting more of that power from the knee and the hip yeah. that is, you know, you're going to get a lot more out of that. Yeah. 100%. So you had a question today in training about how far yeah. should someone be throwing when they're trying to make technical adaptations. And as we walked into the room here into our sweet podcast studio, thanks Coon. Um, although I think I paid for the paint. 
<laughs> Although you did all the work. Anyway, <laughs> um, as I'm walking in, Mo Riddick is texting me and she's going, I want to know how far you want me to be throwing these two weights. And I was like, Mo, you should, the last thing you should be worried about is how far. And she's like, no, no, no. I just want to make sure I'm not throwing them too far because I want to make technical <laughs> changes. And I was like, okay, that's what I want right now. This is because, because I want her, she's having a problem. And if, and if you, I'm going to post one of her technical analysis tonight on throws you, you'll see her right foot as she's starting to rotate to the finish. It pops up early. And we saw it uh, two weeks ago on that Sunday when she was here. Yeah. Um, so I told her, I was like, I want you between this range and I want you to slow. So that would be about, you know, 65 to 80% of her best with those, with those mark, with those, uh, shots. And I want you to focus on just worrying about that technique. And then, you know, the shot should land in this range based mm -hmm. off of the, off of the previous throws, uh, her best throws. And so that was the conversation as we're walking in here. And then you had already cued me on this. So I wanted to see yeah. your take on, you know, what did you tell your meathead college kid who wants to just throw, <laughs> throw, throw, and throw as hard as they possibly can? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? um, I mean, I think it, it just comes down to like, you need to, you need to figure out where you're judging your progress from. Yeah. So, and that's a huge, huge, huge sticking point with everybody. And I mean, it's hard. I went through these the exact same thing. I mean, I didn't even really know about like how crucial technique was in college. Like I, I measured every single throw, went balls to the walls every single throw yeah. during practice, and all I cared about was the distance. And I just went up and down, up and down, up and down every single week until I don't know I threw enough to make progress. I yeah. guess, but, um, but like you need to you need to realize that during the off season, it's like you need to build to something. So you need to be working on something. You need to be building. And what is that? Like you're building strength, but you need to be changing your technique or else you're just spinning in place. Yeah. You're trying to fish for this huge mark and you're really not actually developing yourself as a thrower. And the, the technical side is so crucial and using, so I'll go back, using, finding that progress, you need to find that progress in how you're developing your technique not necessarily how far the implement's going. Right. So you need to make certain measures that and and track them week by week. Like right. how often, like maybe even tally your throws. And I, I actually try doing this, like tallying, let's see what actual percentage of the throws will like he um, reach these positions. Right. Um, and you know, it starts off probably like 10%, but right now he's at like 60 or 70% of the time actually hitting these positions. And I see that as major progress, yeah. even though, you know, the discus might be going the same, the same distance. Mm -hmm. um, but, but what ends up happening then is he has that ingrained in his nervous system. He gains some strength. And then all of a sudden he, when, when that, that new, the new movement patterns are ingrained and the new strength is there, he's more efficient with technique. He's faster in the circle and he has more strength. And then it, creates this huge spike of growth. Yeah, yeah. And that's what people have to comprehend right, is it's right. like, look, give me it when Taman was here this summer, give me give me four months. Give me yeah. four months yeah. of doing this. Mm. Where every throw you're just worried about this, where what we're mm. doing out of the back. Yeah. From the with the, what the right is going to do grounding earlier in the middle and a lower left leg grounding faster at the front. And the mm -hmm. throw will become faster just from improved technique. Yeah. But that feeling is so foreign and you might lose that like big pop at the front for a little bit, even after you're doing a, that's the other thing is like, okay, well, what if my right's coming down early and my left leg is staying low, but you don't have that pop at the front because the timing's still off. Right. So yeah. then you also yeah. have that, to sit that's there. That's huge. That's huge. You have yeah. to sit there and be like, okay, yeah. now there might be two or three weeks that I have to adapt to this right. and then hit it. And I think that that's. You have to be accepting yeah. that that is going to happen too. And I think as coaches, like I have to, I, I, I love to try and also sit there and say, okay, we might have four four days of complete technical work where uh, Malik, the, the guy who had posted on Throws You today, I was like, dude, take these throws at like 60%. And he, he did it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's how you make technical changes. But at the same mm -hmm. time, you've got to have at least six to 10 throws a week where you just hammer it. So that like, you don't really want that. Mm -hmm. Or you can use some special strength movements to, to also uh emulate that that aggressive finish because you don't want them to completely lose 
you know, that yeah, that yeah. snappiness on the finish. So as a coach, you've got to be aware of that. You've got to be aware, like, okay, so when the right comes down early and that left's rotating better, their timing's going to be a little bit off, and you've got to communicate that. It might be two to three weeks where their timing is off, and they have to be aware of that. And you might have to let them get after a couple throws and their technique's bad just so that they have that feeling. But then there's going to be that day where they, you let them go after it and they over-rotate. And they, they don't have the rhythm anymore for the over rotating technique, you know, yeah, for yeah, their yeah. old technique. Yeah. And that's when you're like, okay, now we go back to the the original technical goals. Mm -hmm. And then that's when they're closer to creating that the rhythm for the new technique. So mm -hmm. I think that everybody's yeah. got it's it's such a multi layered it's so multi layered to to, to to make technical changes. It takes yeah. months, yeah. you know, six months. And it, it takes it takes like I mean, it takes time, but yeah. it takes you having to be like set like keeping yourself accountable to it right that you know you can't be you can't be worried like a lot of times you know you'll be working on this one thing but it'll be coming off your hand weird or yeah. you know it'll be you know it might be a little flat or you're a little open at the finish and you know not worrying about those little things that are those last minute adjustments to get the distance actually to be there right but making those like base foundational technical changes now during the off season so that we don't have to worry about those once we get once to competition season. season. Yep. Uh, absolutely. Right. Okay. So Jason, is there any questions? Yeah, we haven't gotten any questions from what I've seen. All right. That means it's time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little nervous. I won't say which ones are Jeff's. There, he had good questions. Yeah, he did have he had good questions when he was asking me. Um, actually, one of these was directly yeah. <laughs> one of these was directly from something Jeff did. It's actually the first question, and it is. All right, so we're gonna do this fast. You yeah. Give me an answer, and then we're gonna go through all six of these questions like one after the other. All right. Okay. Should you compromise with athletes? Yes. All right. Um, technique or strength during the off season? Both. <laughs> technique. Is there a sixty forty? I would say seventy percent. Uh, sixty percent technique, forty percent strength. All right. Female discus throwers, reverse or non reverse? <laughs> non reverse. Then <laughs> <laughs> Peyton, Peyton reverses. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right. Here we go. You can only do one of these ever for the rest of your life. Oh, geez. Buys or tries? Tries. Tries. Really? <laughs> yeah. All, right. All right. Same thing here. One for the rest of your life. Kombucha or kefir? Oh. <laughs> your That's... favorite fermented drinks. <laughs> <laughs> I think what's so hard about that is that kombucha is like my snack drink and kefir is like my, like, it's so healthy. You say kefir. <laughs> but it's so it's so healthy and there's got more protein. I gotta go with kombucha. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right here's a question you asked someone recently: um, Who's your favorite Olympian, Jordan Burroughs or Ryan Krauser? <laughs> oh, for me, <laughs> yeah, Burroughs, Burroughs, all Oof. day, all day. Sorry. Betraying the throwing. Sorry, world. Krauser. <laughs> I think <laughs> Krauser's legit, obviously, but but Burroughs just has it. All right. Especially after, the, especially after he he came back and he uh, he lost in the first round of the 2016 Olympics. It was done. Everybody thought his career was over. He came back, won the 2017 World Championships. Then he lost again in the second round this year at Worlds. Came back and got bronze. So I just he's like a he's just I don't that's know. Impressive. He's a guy that's like changed the sport of wrestling. So yeah. yeah. All right, and one more. If you'd have to throw outside. Would you rather do it in 20 degree re weather or 100 degree weather? 20. 20? Yeah. All right. Yeah, for sure. Because I always could put on a sweatshirt. I could warm up. I would always warm up in the barn and I'd get a good it's sweat going. Cam loops. Like, that's yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We, I remember we threw outside in negative 14 degree weather yeah. Celsius. So it's like, I want to say that's like right around zero. And I remember just the shot. We, we would keep it in, I'd keep it in my house so it would be warm. And throwing it, and by like the tenth throw, it would turn into a snowball when it would roll up. So you'd have like a shot, and you'd have to pull the snow off of it. But I just, I always liked it, and I always felt like then when I would go inside, or I would get into the warmth, 
I would throw so much better. I'd, oh, yeah. Like, I'd yeah, just yeah, be yeah. like, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to kill stuff today. Yeah. So I don't know. I think it's like there's like the the mental toughness. And it, re- it would make me feel like Jordan Burroughs, really. That's what it would be. It would be like, oh, man, I'm so tough. I'm training in the snow. But it's also like you have to – you have to try just a little bit harder to stay attentive and, and stay focused on details. So, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think it's optimal, but for well, me, yeah. it's definitely not <laughs> optimal. Neither is throwing in 100 degree right, weather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was good. Depends so, whether it's 100 degree weather in Pennsylvania or, or 100 Arizona. degree. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing. Arizona, I'm sure, is a lot better than PA. And when I was in Uzbekistan, it was, it was 105 and it felt like it was 85 back really? home. Yeah. It's like, dude, this is crazy. Like, yeah. at home, it's 85. It's terrible. Yeah. All right, so we'll be back again next week at around 7.30 for another edition of The Throw Show. Peace.